So this video is going to be slightly different because, well, we have just reached 5,000 subscribers. I know it's a cliche and people you know, always say this, but I honestly never thought I'll get to this point. When I started YouTube, I thought maybe it would be nice to reach 1,000 subscribers, but the thing of YouTube, you can't control the output so I, you know, I can't control the number of views I get, the subscribers I get, likes, etc. But all my goal was right at the beginning of my journey was that if my videos, or at least each video, can help one person, then they've done their job. Just to grow to 5,000 subscribers in nine months, I mean, it's amazing. Even if you've just watched one of my videos, then I really, really appreciate it. It means the world to me. And if you're watching this video and you haven't subscribed yet, then there's still time to click the subscribe button below. Anyway, in this video, I kind of wanted just to go over some questions I frequently get on my various platforms around like data science, advice, careers, etc. Just questions you guys have sent in. And if you have any further questions, then feel free to leave it in the comments below. Anyway, let's get on with it. So the first question I have is, do you need to know all these technical things to become a data scientist? Now, I'm assuming the person who wrote uh, the question assumes things like Git, Python, SQL, uh, just all the range of technologies that I discuss on this channel. Now, just to get into data science, I don't think you need to know everything. Obviously, the industry is changing all the time and it's really job specific. But in my opinion, if I think back to when I landed in my first role in data science, I wasn't amazing at everything. I mean, I, was, I wouldn't even say I was good at anything, really. I was just kind of decent enough that, and interested enough that the employer uh, wanted to take, like, you know, like me enough for the role. So in my opinion, you don't need to know everything. The main things I think you should really know is that being able to kind of code in Python, again, not completely fluent, not like an expert in production systems. But if you can just write functions and do basic machine learning models on scikit-learn, for example, that should be more than sufficient for a lot of like graduate roles and entry roles as well. And things like SQL probably should have a basic understanding because a lot of the interview process or a lot of the interview processes have some sort of SQL component. But again, it varies. And with that, just basic understanding of machine learning. It doesn't need to be anything like really fancy. I'm, talk I'm talking about things like linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees. You don't need to even know like really deep neural nets or reinforcement learning or any of that fancy stuff. Just like the regular classical ML things, it's just kind of all the technical knowledge you need. So to summarize, I appreciate that was a bit of a waffle, but this video is kind of going to be like that. Um, you basically need to know quite like entry slash intermediate level Python and be able to code in the IDE. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is a good way to start and also have some basic SQL that you can answer basic queries and kind of have a solid grasp of the basics of ML and how to use them on Python. So the second question is, how important is lead code, hacker rank, etc., for landing uh, a data science role? So for those of you who don't really know what lead code or hacker rank is, I've talked about it in, in a few of my videos. But it's basically like a coding challenges platform. And what companies would do is that they would often have it as part of the interview process just to gauge your coding abilities. Now, they seem to be very popular, particularly in American tech companies for software engineers. I'm sure if you're around the tech space online, you'll see a lot of memes about, you know, data structure algorithms, reversing a linked list, binary tree search, all these like terms. And the reason they're memes is because often the stuff they get you to do on these coding challenges aren't necessarily representative of what you'd be doing in your day-to-day -day role. The reason they use them is mainly just to filter out candidates. I think for data science, from my personal experience, again, this is also UK based, which is slightly different to America. I've never really seen these problems necessarily given that much. I've had a few hacker rank problems here and there, but I don't think they're that prevalent. So if you're going to be a data scientist, I don't think you need to worry too much about being really good at these types of, you know, lead code hacker rank type of problems because I've rarely seen them in interviews. The third question I've got is kind of similar to the last one, but the person says, I studied physics at college. By dealing with so many Python libraries and tools like IDEs, Git and Docker, they cause me troubles. I've seen other people's projects and some of them seem daunting enough to disappoint me. Do you have any advice? So what you're kind of experiencing is very similar to imposter syndrome, but not quite. 
you're basically thinking that, you know, all these people are doing such f fancy stuff and you can never possibly get to their level. Now, the secret I've learned, it's not even a secret, it's just a realization that I've had over working three years in this industry, is that nothing is really that hard and everything seems harder than it is. When you look at someone else's code, happens to me still, I think, wow, it's amazing, it's so nice. But I promise you, it's really not that difficult. Once you kind of get the basics down, you can really accelerate your learning and learn all these things quicker. Chances are, there's probably someone who's got like a similar background to you, and it's probably not as smart as you, but has also learned all these things. So the fact that someone dumber than you has learned this thing, then you can definitely learn it. I mean, on this channel, I talk about data science, math, statistics, all these kind of complex, hard topics people see them as. But I'm really not that smart. I'm obviously not dumb, not that's something arrogant, but I'm really not that clever. And I don't think people should think people who work in data science or tech are really clever because yes, some of them are really geniuses. I've worked with a few geniuses, I'm sure. But most people are just ordinary intelligence. But they just work really hard and they learn these things. And that's all there really is to it. The fourth question, which is one we get asked quite a lot as data scientists is, I recently saw a post that said OpenAI is working towards using AI to create code such that programmers won't be needed. What are your perspectives on this with regards to data science? So that's a very hard question to answer because no matter how I answer it right now, I'll definitely be proven wrong in the future. But I'll give you my perspectives and my opinions as of today, which is the 18th of May, 2024. So with AI taking the data science job, at the moment, I'm definitely not worried. First of all, I think there's a lot of hype with Gen AI, personally, this is my opinion. And if you think when it was released back in November 2022, people thought it's going to revolutionize the world. The question I ask you now, and the question my boss asked me was, has anything really changed? I don't think so. Like a year and a half, and this revolutionary technology hasn't been revolutionary yet. Yes, it's a really good productivity tool, but has it replaced certain people? I haven't heard much. There is stories, and I'm sure, about it replacing some people's jobs. But how many? Like, I can't think on top of my head anything that's it's really revolutionized. Yes, we have like these custom GPTs, which help us with day-to-day -day tasks. Brilliant. But apart from that, my Grammarly tool, like, shout out Grammarly, it's actually probably equally as good as ChatGPT at improving my writing. In terms of if I think like the programming aspect is going to remove from a data scientist, no. I mean, you got to think as a data scientist, at least is how I think of it. I just said that our job is mainly like being really good, in my opinion, at our mathematical reasoning, data, like seeing patterns. That's what we're like meant to do. Coding is just a tool to help us solve the problem. It's not the job itself. I don't care if I can get ChatGPT to write all my code for me. It can't mathematically reason at the moment about the problems we're trying to solve in business. If you look throughout history, what you find is that the jobs or the skills that have been kind of consistent, that have been kind of future-proof, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, the Renaissance, these kind of periods of you know, significant change, the one thing that has became valuable is mathematics. If you're good at maths and your mathematical ability is really good, then I'm not you know, saying this is definite, but throughout history, that's kind of made you not like job proof, but kind of you've always got to have a job because maths is something that's very, very hard for a machine, even AI at the moment to really comprehend and solve problems. Like if you give ChatGPT like firm math loss theorem, for example, it can't solve it, right? It may attempt to solve it, but it won't give you a neat proof necessarily. There has been, you know, cases where it solved the mathematical Olympiad problems. But again, a very small range of problems, very niche. And it's getting there, and I do believe that at some point it may be able to break through, but it's a very, very difficult. I may be wrong, and I may be out of the job in a year. And then we can look back at this video and laugh. But I'm confident that at least five years, solid, I'll be a data scientist. Maybe OpenAI 
get AGI out there within next year, maybe tomorrow, and then others are full. But so be it. This is my current view as a stance uh, on May 18th, 2024. The next question I've got is describe the data science interview process. Now, this is a good one, and I'm going to answer this from my experience, particularly within the UK. Again, it may vary between America, the EU, and so forth. But in the UK, the process is generally like three to four steps. The first step is that you normally have a call with uh, a recruiter, um, the talent team, just kind of the people who are looking for candidates for a certain role. You have a discussion with them, and that's mainly about you know, timeline, salary, X, Y, Z, all kind of the admin things. Then if they think your CV, just general experience is what they're looking for, then you move on to pretty much an interview with the hiring manager or someone technical. Typically be another data scientist within a company. You have a technical interview, uh, just general discussion about your experience as well. And then after that, they'll move you on to the next stage. This part kind of varies between companies. You be some sort of technical interview, whether it's a take home task, a coding problem, or another technical interview. Just something technical related, just to gauge your abilities. Then after that, I think that's pretty much you get your decision. It varies between companies. Sometimes there'll be like a culture interview. Sometimes it'll just be a group problem. You know, in graduate schemes, they like to do like a group assessment where you're working in a team to solve a problem. It really varies, but those are just generally the four stages uh, I, I've experienced and heard from experience, particularly in the UK for data science roles. So the next question I've got is, how do you balance your career, learning and social life? It would be great if you could share a bit about this. Yeah, so this is quite an interesting question because I think it's really specific to the person. But in terms of career, as a data scientist, you're, you've got pretty good work-life balance. Like you work like nine to six on average, eight to six, if that, again, depends on, on the industry. I personally work nine to 5.30. I may work a bit longer if I'm really interested in it or a deadline. I hardly work past seven, you know, rarely hit seven. I'm normally nine to five thirty pretty much every day. Then for learning, because I work from home kind of uh, most of the week, kind of like three to four days a week, I basically use my commute time, so the time I would spend going into the office and back as learning time. So every morning I get up around 6.30, 7 o'clock. Then I'd work from seven to nine, just studying, um, creating videos, just doing things that can benefit my career and I also find it really interesting. Then after work, because you know if I finish at 5.30, it'll take me a good hour to get home, I would also spend that extra hour in learning. So I basically just convert my commute time, which is the time I would spend doing nothing, into learning time. And I'm sure a lot of people can find these pockets in their day where they can benefit to learning. It doesn't need to be too long, but an hour block is quite a lot. If you do an hour every single day, that's five hours across the whole week which is quite a lot of things to learn. And in terms of social life, again, it's really specific on your lifestyle, what you like to do and things like that. I normally try to do is that I finish all my kind of work in Monday to Friday. So I make sure I create a YouTube video in between Monday to Friday and I write a blog or do my studying Monday to Friday. So that way on the weekends, I've got no kind of external pressure on creating things because I've done all the work I need for the week in my work period, Monday to Friday. And so Saturday and Sunday, I can dedicate fully to socializing, um, basically doing what I want. I can work, but I need to because I've done all my deadlines during the week. So I hope that makes sense. I may do a full video about managing time and how I do it properly, but I hope that gave you some basic guidelines or things you, you find interesting. So the last bit I wanna talk about is what's next. So to be honest, what's next is that I'm going to carry on making data science content for you that will hopefully benefit you in some way. I've really enjoyed just helping people get into data science and also teach them more about the field. And I've got really good positive feedback. So I'm just going to carry on and hopefully each video I make can benefit one person. And if it does, then that's a success. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, for 5,000 subscribers. It honestly means the world to me. You don't really understand. I never thought we'd get to this point, but I'm just really kind of amazed that 5,000 people want to listen to me talk about data science every week. Even if you watched one of my videos, it means the world to me. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one. And I'll see you next time.